Hey guys, Spacey here, and welcome to Cora's podcast, Filmmaking, actually. Cora was honored to host a workshop for the Organization of Independent Filmmakers entitled How to Make a Great Film on a Deadline. With so many elements going into every step of creating a film, what are the key points to check when rushing a project from development to completion? In this episode, part one of the workshop, Cora covers how to make a great film on a deadline and gives you an overall understanding of the tentpole aspects that can help to make sure your film holds up. So enjoy. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. I first wanted to thank the Organization of Independent Filmmakers for having me and all of you for coming. Um, I hope this will be helpful for all of you. Just for context, uh, yes, I'm the president of the independent production company, Space Dream Productions, which I co-own with my husband, Spaceship. Yes, his name is Spaceship. <laughs> um, since we officially launched our first film in August of 2016, we've had over 50 projects either move through or currently moving through our production lines. So we've gotten lots of practice on the whole process of making a movie. We've done a lot of 48 hour projects where you're supposed to, and we do, um, actually follow the rules of writing, directing, producing, shooting, and editing the film within a 48 hour block. We've done about 10 of those. So a lot of that experience is what I'm gonna be drawing from for this. And we've had every range from a total dud to, uh, you know, we didn't even make it in time to uh, winning the 48 hour Miami uh, last year, which was pretty cool. So that's a little bit about me. I'm gonna share some of the things that I've learned over the years, specifically just kind of key points to keep in mind when making a film that can really make you stand out as a professional filmmaker and help move your project to a more professional level. So there are a lot of steps to making a film and not everything I'm gonna cover is going to apply to everybody. But if you're looking at working as a producer, which is the person who gets a project going and takes it from idea through completion, um, and if you're someone who does that, congratulations, you're a producer. Um, only producers need to worry about every single thing that I'm going to be covering. The rest applies to more specific areas. And hopefully, if you are a more specified role, having the information kind of helps see where you fit so you can kind of work as part of the team with everybody else. Take from it what you will. This is my own experience. So however it works for you is really what it comes down to at the end of the day. One part of filmmaking is actually a legal side. There are release forms that you need and copyright clearances and allowances for artwork and music and all of that stuff. I'm not going to get into that here because it kind of is its own thing. I do have a podcast episode on it, but um, that is something that if you are going to be submitting to festivals or using a film project, you really should have those release forms in place. And that is something that you should learn about separately. Okay. So all of that said, when you're making a film, the first thing you need to figure out is why am I making this? And that doesn't need to be some like deep soul searching, go meditate for five months. This is how to make a film on a deadline, not how to develop your screenplay until your grandkids are old enough to fund it with their retirement fund. Um, if you need to know what the purpose is behind you doing it, because there's various choices you're going to have to make along the way when you're putting your film together. So I know a lot of people are here from the OIF Film Challenge, which is awesome. And it's okay if the why is to win a contest, but you should probably look a little bit deeper. What story do you want to tell? What do you want the audience to feel? What are you trying to communicate? Sometimes, you are just making a film for a contest. You have to fit their runtime or their character requirements or genre requirements or whatever. Um, and you have to take that into account when you're making your film. If you're looking at going to festivals, they say that seven to 12 minutes is the festival sweet spot. It is that does make films much more programmable but I've seen films at Sundance that were like a minute long and I've seen shorts at Sundance that were literally like 30 minutes long. So don't take any of these things as like a, a rock that can't be moved. The most important thing to know about filmmaking is it's an art. There's no A, B, C, D, E, F, G. If you add these up together, you get X and that's it because it doesn't work like that. I wish it did, but it really doesn't. So, um, these are some things that just might help along the way. Some of it might work for you, some of it might not. 
Remember, even Marvel and Disney had no idea Black Panther would make a billion dollars. And sometimes you just have to go make something and see what happens. So when you're getting started, your script and the style of your story and what you're making have to fit either the competition you're entering or festivals or very leaning into the genre or whatever it is, you know, and if it is just to make you and your team look cool, which is valid, why are you wanting to make the movie? Because to be rich and famous doesn't always give you the best story. But if you have another reason in there, you can use that like as a pin to hold down a bunch of other choices. Unfortunately, your own fame and fortune isn't great character motivation. <laughs> uh, as you're going through and putting your story together, really look at what audience is this for? What story are you trying to tell? Who are you trying to reach with this piece? Um, also, if you're making a feature film, I am going to lean into shorts with this because a, I don't have a ton of time. We have an hour and a half. And also because features kind of are their own beast in itself. If you're making a feature film, one of the reasons really has to be to sell it. Because, I mean, unless you're like an independently wealthy person who just has a ton of disposable cash to blow and making a movie, in which case, call me. I have some movies we could make. Um, but if um, there's a business side to film that is more relevant for features, so that's something to consider when you're looking at making a feature film. I'm going to assume that most of you are here because you're making shorts, so uh, we're going to lean into that. One thing you can do to help you with your development is look at your resources. You know, what locations do you have access to? And something to consider with your location is locations that look cool are not the only location requirement. What's the sound like at the location? Is it right next to a busy highway? Um, what time of day are you filming? And are there crickets or frogs or other noises that are going to kick up? Are you near a dirt bike track or a concert hall that maybe is quiet in the afternoon, but very loud in the evening? Are there fans or refrigerators that you can't turn off? Is there parking for people? Are there bathrooms <laughs> that people can get to? Do you have space for gear and snacks and everything that you need to kind of facilitate your crew? Those are all things to consider when you're looking at your location so you don't get there day of and you're like, what do I do? Um, if you're doing a project where you know your team, you can ask them ahead of time. Like if you're doing a 48 hour film project, you know who you're working with or an OIF, you know who you're working with, find out their skills and what they can bring to the table because you can use that in your script writing. Um, what are they willing to do or unwilling to do? Maybe they have like an authentic vintage army costume and you can lean into that as a character element. Uh, maybe a friend has a pizza restaurant and they would let you film in it after hours. Um, again, check for sound because they've got refrigerators and stuff. But um, really pull your resources, list them out. There's a really great scene um, in a movie about NASA having to fix a spaceship from Earth, like it's in space and NASA's in Earth, and they've got this box and in the box is every single piece of movable anything that's on the spaceship, I think even like toilet paper is in this box and they dump it on the table and they can use anything in the box to fix the spaceship. They can tell the astronauts what to do with these objects. When you're making a movie, especially if you're on a deadline, make a box, put everything in it that you could possibly use, even if you don't use it, just have it there because you never know what it's gonna inspire. Um, once you have that nailed down, that direction is something that you're going to use when you go to write your script. So this is going to sound very silly. The best way to write a script is to write it, especially when you're in a rush. You literally just need to write it. You know, you can use the list of things you made for inspiration. Um, you have a friend who's an actor who's an amazing swimmer. You have access to a pool. Sounds like you can make a movie about a swimmer really easily, get some good production value of somebody in the water. Maybe you have someone who speaks sign language and you have to make a silent film. You can lean into that. Just get something on paper. It sounds so reductively simple, but you literally cannot edit something you haven't written. So when it comes to writing, just write. Don't critique yourself. Don't think about what you're going to post on social media about what you wrote. Don't worry about your friends. Just get the words on the page. No one has to see it but you. If you don't know what the characters should say, if you're writing along and you hit a point where a character, you just can't figure out a cool way to say it, 
just literally have the character say, this is the part where I yell at you because I need you to get pissed off and leave. And then write the next character gets pissed off and leave. Like literally you can get that basic. You just need to get it, get something there so that you can start to work with it. Maybe you get to another scene later that gives you an idea. Maybe they don't need to yell at all once you're like looking at the whole story. Just get it down on paper, whatever it takes. If you need to set a timer, you can uh, do that. Like say, I'm just going to write for 10 minutes and just force yourself to just write. Um, if you really just can't get a story to go in a direction, it's called writer's block for a reason. Maybe your character is not supposed to go that way. Just write them in a different direction. If your characters are just stuck, write the total opposite. You know, if you're writing about an old woman who's very conservative and care, you know, very careful and quiet and meek, and you just can't think of anything, just to keep yourself writing, have her like strip down to her underwear and go running through a local supermarket screaming hallelujah at the top of her lungs. You'll either wind up with some crazy character quirks or your brain will kind of kick in and be like, she wouldn't do that. She would do this. And it kind of like helps you just get it going. So just get it written and then edit it. It does help to know where you're going overall, have a little bit of an outline or a little bit of you know, I'm going to make a story about a swimmer that wins a gold medal, or I'm going to make a story about a little girl who almost drowns and her brother saves her or whatever, like get a concept of what you're going to do. And then don't worry about your page count. And if this doesn't happen by page two, the distributors are going to get pissed off. They're not going to want to buy it. Just write it. And then you can get all those pieces in place. Because if you put yourself in a box, not the kind of box where you're putting your, your resources, but if you like paint yourself into a corner without even giving yourself a brush, you're just pouring paint all over the floor, give yourself a chance to get that story started. I will say there's a very um, popular idea of one page equals one minute of screen time. That is a very true statement if you are writing like a 1950s sitcom. Modern day filmmaking, unfortunately, does not follow that exactly. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it totally does. We have our film Names on the Wall. It's currently on Amazon and it's about 25 minutes, I think. The script is, I think, 13 or 14 pages and it's a 25 minute film. Um, we've done 48 hour film projects where the script is like 12 pages. And even as we're writing it, my husband is like, that's too long. And I'm like, no, try Like, look, I, I end it seven minutes. Um, there's no way your screenplay is going to account for every beat of action, every actor reaction to dialogue, every moment of silence between someone walking into a room and then doing whatever you need them to do. And if you're writing all of that into your screenplay, you're writing a novel and you kind of need to back off and let the director and the actors do their job. So write a screenplay, give it room to breathe, and for the other members of the creative team to like contribute into it and bring the story to life. I will say if you have to hit a runtime, get your script written, like focus on just getting the story, make your point, and then read it. Don't read it like a table read. You don't have to like get a bunch of people together and do some big complicated thing. Literally just sit there and just set a timer and read it out loud and just read it the way you envision it in your head as the writer. Give people moments to react, give them time to walk in, to walk out, give them beats, like pause for a little bit and see how long it takes. And maybe your five page script is a 20 minute film. Maybe your five page script is a two minute film. So the only way you're going to know is by actually timing it out and pacing it. But don't do that until you've actually written it or you're gonna drive yourself crazy like editing and re-editing before you're even finished. Um, once it's written, edit it to a good story and then you can cut for time. Also, when you edit, you can check for things like are your characters really boring? <laughs> um, you know, are the women all cute and sexy and the men are all really strong and stupid? Could a character's gender be swapped and could that make the story more interesting? Did you write for like a type instead of writing for a person? Did you make a character a specific race for absolutely no reason when literally any good actor could portray that character no matter what race or nationality they are? You know, did you awesomely wanted to include a disabled person or someone from a marginalized culture, but then all of their dialogue is literally about the fact that they're disabled or that they're marginalized in some way when it doesn't 
have anything to do with the plot. And you could have just written a story about a human who happens to be disabled or a human who happens to be marginalized. Obviously, if your story is about disability or it's about you know being part of a marginalized culture, that's different. But if your story is about a bunch of friends going to the mall and one of them happens to be a wheelchair user, everything the person says doesn't have to be about the fact that they're a wheelchair user. It can be about the fact that they love those jeans or they really want to go get an ice cream. Like they're a person. So treat your characters like people, no matter what other characteristics you give them. I've had some really good experience with screenplays where we get them and we read them and they're fascinating. And I go, what would happen if, and we flip the gender, like all around, we make male characters, female, female characters, male. And it's very interesting to me to see like, we're way down the line. And this one male character is just so boring. Everything he says is just so boring. And I'm trying to figure out why is his dialogue so meh. And then like my husband points out, well, it was originally written as a female character and you flipped it. And I was like, oh, <laughs> and we go through and just kind of like punch up the dialogue. Um, so another thing to look at, not just if it's boring, but I've seen this a lot with indie filmmakers where they just like pepper their film with like, really harsh profanity or just a lot of casual profanity where like every other word because they want to be edgy or they want to be real and sometimes it's just overkill when your characters could be so much more interesting if they used their words like yeah sometimes they have to like scream f you at the top of their lungs but what do they mean why are they saying that like could they say something more powerful Maybe your little conservative old lady who's very shy and timid, her screaming that could be like, whoa, and it's a, a character moment. But if someone's just like dropping an F-bomb every two minutes because that's how people talk, it makes your character very flat because there's no, unless that's that specific character in that specific world. But if that's just your whole script and every single person, try and find a way for your character to be real and to communicate what they feel and what they mean or have that be a, a struggle that they have. Maybe they can't communicate and that's part of the problem and that's something that they deal with as a character. Um, are all of your characters saying the same thing? Like they all have the same rhythm and cadence, they all use the same slang. Sometimes that can be cool for like a group, but you want your characters to be individual people too. Also make sure that you haven't like gone so off the deep end with making your characters interesting that now they're not, they're not actually saying anything <laughs> like when you read it it's it's like what, what's happening like the dialogue is so like esoteric that you don't really know what's going on um there's a really amazing example he's in the social network where he's on a date and he's talking about one thing and she's trying to like talk to him like on a date and their conversation is super awkward and he's saying one thing and and she's trying to get him to talk about something else and he's not really acknowledging her. That's something that makes for an awkward conversation. And it's something to keep in mind when writing dialogue because you don't have to be perfect. Like when someone says something, the next person doesn't have to say, okay, or cool. Like everybody doesn't always acknowledge people. They probably should, but they don't. And sometimes a conversation can be super layered or add tension if one person's saying A, the other person's talking about B, or if there's just double meaning. There's a great scene in the TV show Smash. I won't say too much about it because it's a little bit of a spoiler, but there's two characters that are reading a script um, that for a Broadway show, but those two characters kind of almost like had an affair. So they're reading the script and the producer's trying to get the scene worked out and the two characters are saying things from their heart to each other, but it fits the script they're reading and they get in this like argument and like one of the other, the producer or the director is like, did anybody write that down? Because they think, oh, they're just reading as characters, but they were reading, they were speaking from their heart. It just made for a very interesting scene and that's something to look at when you're kind of going through your script with a fine tooth comb. Uh, another thing is don't go crazy <laughs> with that. You could spend a lifetime polishing your dialogue. Um, the most interesting part of your script should always be the story and anything that is happening, being put into your script, being taken out of your script, it should always be something that makes the story more interesting. Another thing to keep in mind is what is the dynamic of the screenplay? Like where is your lead character angry when it starts and then they're angry when it ends and everybody's just kind of angry the whole time? I mean, sometimes it's funny to have a character who's just, okay, like inside out. 
obviously those characters have their emotions, but like, unless you're going to really lean into a sort of monotoned character who just has their emotion and that's it, most people move around, you know, and you want that emotion to move around in your scenes. If it starts angry, maybe end it sad. If it starts sad, maybe end it scared. Um, if doing this to every single scene makes your script feel like a totally unstable person with just emotions everywhere, um, find a place where maybe the emotion should carry. Maybe there is a point of monotony or boredom or prolonged grief or prolonged joy that then is destroyed by some horrible all is lost moment. Um, really lean into emotion and using all of those pieces um, so that you can uh, make your audience feel something that isn't just like a, a flat line. Another thing to consider at the script stage is audio. Um, you can actually bring in your director and your post-production team, like your post-audio team, when you're writing your script. That's not something that a lot of people do, but if you're planning for sound, um, one of my mentors very awesomely gave me the example of filmmaking as kind of like decorating a room. And if you put pictures like wall to wall and sound is the curtains, now you have no place to hang the curtains because there's just stuff everywhere. So if you consider sound, if you consider moments of silence or moments of the wind blowing or a storm or music or um, a conversation happening in another room or someone's stomach gurgling, like any piece of audio can be planned for in the script stage so that when you're filming, you give space for that audio to be put in and it gives the actor time to react to that. If a shower is turning on in the other room, you can have that moment of the actor being like, you know, what is that? And then getting up and walking over and you can lay in the sound when you're finished. So um, yeah, talking about audio during the script writing phase can add another layer to just the whole production process. And yeah, okay, so you've got your script, you've got an interesting story, um, about interesting characters with interesting character traits that speak to the character and you're ready to make it. Sometimes you got to tell yourself you're done, <laughs> especially if you're working on a deadline. Um, sometimes you got to go, this is good enough. Sometimes you got to say, I still don't love that dialogue. We're going to get it in front of the actors and see how they polish it. Sometimes the dialogue is just kind of meh and you got to go with it. Um, if you're on a deadline, sometimes you just got to say, okay, it's, this is good enough. Never let the perfect get in the way. Of, sorry, <laughs> so important too. Never let the perfect get in the way of the good. That is such an important thing to keep in mind as a filmmaker. If you get too technical and you hang up on like the minutia, you're never going to finish the actual film, which is the whole point. So that is um, the script writing section. If anybody has any questions about that, I'm going to jump over to the chat here. Meredith, I agree um, when language just isn't used as a, a thing. Um, yeah, exactly. If your profanity is forced, it's it just, it doesn't fit. It should be natural. It should be real. Your characters are people, so treat them like people. Um, all right, let's see. Um, cool. All right. So I went through the, the comments there. I'm going to, moving right along. Wow, you guys are great. I'm going to cover everything super fast. <laughs> Um, so, all right, you've got your script, you're going to start putting together your crew. Um, one thing that's really important is casting. Um, and that's important because bad performances can pretty much ruin a beautiful script. Um, if you have your talent in mind when you're writing your uh, screenplay, maybe you already have your team and you're writing for those actors. I mean, that's great. Congratulations. You wrote your script, give them the, give it to them, have them get started you are done with casting. If you're gonna be actually casting and holding auditions, what are some things that should be looked for? Oh, okay, um, I'm gonna jump back to the script writing for a sec because uh, someone just asked a copywriting question. The question is, I have a script that could be a series or feature. How do I copyright it if I want it open for both? Do you recommend only copywriting or registering? Uh, I think it means that as well. So, um, Copywriting does not limit you. Like if you copyright a screenplay as a feature film and then you develop it into a TV series, you're not like breaking some rule by doing that. The copyright registration will only be as a film, but 
it will be evidence that that was your idea. Those characters, that dialogue, that storyline will be registered as the feature film. Personally, I would just say anything that you do, just register it. Um, if you've got a finished film, you know, watermark it, put your uh, info on it. If you can't afford the registration fees, there's a very old way <laughs> of copywriting your material. And that is print it, put it in an envelope, seal it, stamp it, and mail it to yourself. And don't open it because then you've basically got a preserved stamp by the US government date and time for that material. That's kind of like the old school way of doing it. As far as registering with the Writers Guild, you can definitely do that also. I'm a big fan of like contracts and legal and like really having your ducks in the row because it, uh, yeah, the poor man's copyright, that's right. Um, really having your ducks in a row because that really helps you down the line. It's it's an ounce of prevention being worth a ton of cure or whatever that expression is. If you have something that you want to keep the ownership of and really document that, go ahead and register it with the Writers Guild with the US Copyright Office. Like just, it's, it's worth it in the end because that, you know, whatever little copyright fee is a lot cheaper than like hundreds of thousands of dollars in a lawsuit, just saying. Again, this is all the legal stuff that I said is like a whole other side of things. Um, the best thing to do is talk to a lawyer because I'm not a lawyer. I can say my opinion, but it's not legal advice. Um, if you need a lawyer and need some recommendations, I definitely have lawyers that I work with that I adore and I trust, and I'm happy to refer you to them if you need. And then I'm seeing some conversation happening here about uh, music influencing the writing. Um, I love that. I absolutely, totally think that that's incredible. It's something that more people really need to lean into. I put music and that whole sound discussion, I put it kind of in the production and post-production side, even though it really does belong in the screenwriting part of things. Um, I'll be getting to all that. So I'm not blowing by your comments. I'm just going to wait until we get to that. Okay, good. I'm just going to jump back over to casting real quick. I love the conversation happening about screenwriting. Um, so um, if you're going to cast and you're going to hold auditions, um, what, what do you look for? How do you know when you're doing an audition that you're casting the right person? The first thing I'm going to say is something that I think is very important. Don't cast by gender, age, look, skin color, body shape, size, ability, any of that stuff, unless you have to for your story. For example, the first film Space Dream Productions did was a Vietnam War film. Obviously, our Vietnam soldier was a Vietnamese actor, <laughs> because that's the only person that would be cast for a role like that. The American soldier was an American. They were both male because the majority of soldiers were men. And for that specific story, we wanted it to be a little bit basic in that way. And that was part of our story. If you are writing a physical description or race or gender, or anything like that into your script, ask yourself why. That doesn't mean don't cast by race. You know, sometimes if you're writing an American Civil War film, obviously the general of the Confederate army is not going to be portrayed by a person of color because that doesn't make any sense. So pick things that make sense for your story, but don't limit unless it's part of your story. Otherwise, just open up your casting. Sometimes you will get a completely different person than maybe you were visualizing while you were writing. And it's a great way to kind of open up some more like inclusiveness to your filmmaking process. Also totally bluntly from a filmmaking side, it literally like quadruples your resources for that specific role. Because if you're not like, they have to be six foot two blonde size four, like very specific. If it's just like, they need to be female because this is a story about a female between the ages of mm, 32 and 41, kind of in that age group, you are opening up to an entire world of talent by not limiting yourself. When you do the auditions, make sure your actors have sides, the little like selection of a scene. Um, I've gone so far as to take pieces of scenes and kind of put them together in a little mini script for an audition, just because I want to kind of see how the character moves through different emotions in the audition. Um, like, don't take two random things, but things where it works together for one read. Um, and if you can, you know, you don't have to make people cold read. When they're going to be getting on set, you have time for them to study the script. So give them the script, let them actually read through it. Actors, prepare. Um, when you've got the lines, try and learn them. See if you can learn them cold before you go in. 
If you're doing a self tape, you know, have someone read with you off screen. I will say when it comes to self tapes, all casting directors and directors are different. They've got different standards. For me personally, um, I don't care if somebody doesn't have someone to read with them. If they can carry the scene by themselves and convincingly portray their side of that conversation with no one else in the room with them, there's a pretty good chance they're going to be able to do it with somebody. So um, I'm always more impressed when someone can just really carry it. Again, don't worry about the technicalities. Just show up and present yourself. For people doing casting, um, check for how relaxed and natural sounding the actor is. It should look like either you accidentally walked in on the room with them or you know you accidentally turned on their webcam. It should look like just somebody in life that you stumbled upon, not like somebody who's acting, you know? <laughs> um, it's, you know, are they existing as the character and are they showing you the scene? And actors, the number one feedback I have to give people all the time is relax. In real life, when you're talking, you're not thinking about the next thing you're going to say. You don't know your next line. You're talking. So when you're talking as a character, don't think about, oh, this is where he's going to say this and I have to do this because this is happening. And then it, like, you, you can't be here when you're acting. You have to be present with the character in the moment. I will say, you know, move around, be natural, embody the character. Take the Michael Caine School of Acting, uh, check it out. It's on YouTube for free. Um, I feel like I just send people there <laughs> all day long. Um, there's a great part about how um, there's a difference between stage acting and film acting. Stage actors, they need to be big. The motions need to read across the state. You know, you have to be seen by the back row of a large theater. But on film, you know, the, the camera's right here. So um, there's a great analogy of how acting on stage is like, you know, performing a surgery with like a scalpel. But acting on film is like performing it with a laser. Very, very precise. And, um, you know, no one on stage can see you kind of go. But on camera, they can. So really, like, lean into the fact that the camera can see every breath you take and you can keep your movements smaller, you can be more nuanced, you can stop and kind of like just be a person without performing at the same level you would if you were on stage. And if you're auditioning for a stage show, then obviously flip that. <laughs> Another thing that's very important during the casting process when you're holding an audition is give them direction and see how they follow it. So, you know, if they do it one way and you say, oh, that's great, can you try it this way? Even if you don't actually want the character to do it that way, you need to see how somebody can take direction because you can have someone who does a great take and you say, awesome, can you try it again? But I'd love to see it a little bit angrier. And they do it exact same way. On set, if the character needs to be angrier and you're saying, can you do it a little angrier and the actor can't change that performance, they've got they've got what they figured out in their head and that's it and they can't shift it, that's a problem. So you need to see how they both take direction and how they deal with your direction. And, you know, it's totally valid for an actor to say, really angrier? I totally thought this was blah, 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 and have a little conversation about it. I don't know if that's a great conversation for the casting room. That's totally fine to have on set or during rehearsals. But um, when you're in the casting room, you need to be able to have that dialogue of giving direction and seeing how they take it. Um, you also should try and do scenes with the actual scene partners. You need to see how the actors interrelate to each other and not just how they do a solo performance to the air, which is super cool, but most movies, you know, there are moments, um, what's that, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood when Leonardo DiCaprio is like alone in his trailer, like that's mind blowing as a scene, but you need to have that same level when there's another person in the scene that you're acting with, like he was with the little girl. Um, so that's something I've seen before where like an actor does a great solo read, but when I put them with their scene partner, they're not with their partner. I have an extra note here. It says, this is very important. If your actors cannot take direction in an audition when they are trying to impress you, they are absolutely not gonna take it on set. So you have to make sure that they can work with the director, they can take direction, they can vibe with the other cast. Otherwise you're gonna give yourself such a headache and waste valuable time that you need for actual filming. Um, and then um, another thing to watch for is continuity. I know that seems like a funny thing to look for when you're auditioning, but 
there's things that you can catch in an audition that are going to mess up your film that if you pay attention during the audition process, you can find them before you're on set or worse, before you're in post-production and your editor is like yanking their hair out. So, you know, an actor does a take and on the third word of the line, they pick up a cup with the right hand. Have them run it again. Just say, that's awesome. You know, uh, I'd love to see that again. You can even give them a little direction and see how they take it. Um, and then um, you do it. It's so important to watch. Does the actor pick up the cup with the same hand in the same way on the same word every time? Or do they pick it up with the left hand once and the right hand another time and they scratch their ear another time and they don't even look at the person another time? Like, obviously, you know, they might be nervous and make a little flub, um, but the physical performance and the way a line is delivered and the physicality that goes with it can destroy your edit. If you have somebody who's not giving the same performance every time, you can't cut back and forth between different takes and it's really, really, really hard in post. So if while you're in the, um, while you're in the audition room, you sit there and pay attention to these things. It's just things you can catch. And you can ask the actor like, hey, I noticed you picked up with your right hand when you said blah last time. Can you do that again this time? And then have them do it two or three more times and, and see. You also have to decide how much time do you want to invest in coaching an actor in an audition. Sometimes somebody is so close and you just want to give them a couple notes and see if they can make it. But if you find yourself giving note after note after note after note, you probably want to move on. And yes, I did see the note about script supervisor being your best friend. Um, on set, yes, the script supervisor will watch these things and will help you. But it wastes a lot of production time if every two seconds or every take, your script supervisor has to go back over to your actor and tell them, hey, last time it was your left hand. Can you do that again? See, I can't even do it. Last time it was your right hand. Can you do it again? And then they do it wrong. Hey, last time it was your right hand. Can you do it again? Like it, you want to try and circumvent the problems later by preparing for them ahead of time. This is just me personally. And I think, I think in the name of mental health of actors everywhere, if you can, if you're not casting like thousands of people and doing some massive like cattle call, take two minutes or one minute. If you're not gonna cast someone, tell them why. Even if it's just a super quick, we went in another direction. Or um, I had somebody once who legit just looked too much like the lead actress. And I said, I'm so sorry, I love you, you're incredible. When I put you next to her, you look like twins and that does not fit for the story. You're amazing, best of luck, totally gonna call you if we have another role. Um, I uh, once had an actress whose performance was amazing, but I couldn't give her notes. Every time I gave her notes, there was like this static or like it just wasn't, like I could feel like she didn't agree and just kind of wanted to keep doing it her way and would sort of begrudgingly. And I was just like, and we called her back and called her back, you know, it was one of these like final callbacks and we kept having her come back. And after a couple of times, I had one of my associates with me and she was like, and it was actually a friend of hers. And she was like, I'm so sorry. And I said, I'm sorry too. So we called her in and I literally told her, I said, look, I, I love your energy. I love you for this character. I think you're a great performance, but I'm having a little bit of difficulty giving you notes. I feel like there's like this kickback every time I try and, and give a note, I feel like maybe it's not being received. And she literally said, really? I didn't feel that way. And I was like, <laughs> This is exactly what I'm talking about. So, um, you know, if I had any doubts about cutting her after that conversation, I was like, okay, that was the right choice, unfortunately. But um, I mean, she couldn't even see the issue she was causing in the casting room when people are usually kind of hyper aware of everything going on. Anyway, at the end of the day, you're casting, you should have people who your director and team can work with, who embody your characters, who can naturally portray your script and bring your story to life together as a cast. That is what you're going for when you're doing the casting process. That was part one of the workshop. A big thank you to the Organization of Independent Filmmakers and to everyone who participated in the workshop. Stay tuned for part two. Now it's time to roll that beautiful bean footage. I mean, end credits. Bye. That's from the Bush's baked bean commercials. They would say, roll that beautiful... The dog would talk. It was a talking dog. They had a talking dog and it would say, roll that beautiful bean footage. Just imagine the... It's, I'm not making it up. Okay, you've been listening to Filmmaking Actually with Cora Linda, Space Dream Productions podcast. Subscribe to us on any or all the podcast platforms, but we especially recommend our sponsor, Anchor, 
If you like what you hear, leave us five-star ratings and positive reviews on iTunes and Stitcher. It helps more listeners like you discover the show. But the best thing you can do if you really like the show is tell a friend. Want to leave a comment or ask a question? Email at filmmakingactually at gmail.com. It's the Spacey speaking. And remember, I love indie films. Raiders, Temple of Doom, Last Crusade. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. <laughs>